Anglican. Welcome to the second recording of Anglican Unscripted episode 673. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's Jet July 13th, 2021. All right, welcome to the second recording of the show. I'm an IT guy. I should be checking the how full my disks are on the hard drives here before I press record. And I had gone two years without checking. Lo and behold, we recorded a wonderful 43-minute episode that only 14 minutes got recorded of. So we're going to have to go here and put, scramble, get everything back together. It's 3.42 in the afternoon, so I'm going to be publishing this late. Um, The RV is hot because I turned the AC off so that you don't have to hear the AC in the background. So we're going to sweat through this week's episode. Before we get too far, please like the show on YouTube or Facebook. That's free advertising. Comment if you're not commented, or even if you have commented, go to the comment section. Tell us what you think about what we're talking about. We love to read them. We sometimes respond to them, but we know that the conversation doesn't end when we're done talking. Subscribe to the show if you're not subscribed. We're getting really, really close to 7,000 subscribers, which in the world of YouTube, that's, that's, that's nothing. But in the world of Anglican news, that's everybody. That's all of you. That's, that's the whole kit and caboodle. And we have a podcast. If you don't want to see us on screen, you can listen to us in audio only. Go to the show notes on YouTube. For each episode, you can click and you'll get a link to subscribe to the podcast. George, how you been doing this week? Just great. We had a COVID scare at church. Uh, my bookkeeper came down with the, the virus on Monday of this week. Past, yes, last week. Mm-hmm. And this was a bit of a shock as she'd been vaccinated. And so she's been out sick and everybody who came and she she got sick on Friday, last Friday, mm-hmm. and I believe she came down with it on uh, over the week prior weekend. All the uh, staff and everybody who came in contact with her had the COVID tests over the weekend and we're all in the clear. And in checking out everybody in the church staff, ministers, lay people, we've all been vaccinated. Only the bookkeeper had the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. We all, the other, the rest of us had the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. And checking a little bit deeper, I found that uh, according to Wikipedia, well, the, the Johnson and Johnson kind of life, yeah. is seventy four percent effective as opposed to ninety eight and ninety four percent for the other two, for the two shot ones. So I was a little frightened that we'd go back into another COVID panic if more of us got sick. But it looks like the vaccines are work. Some of the vaccines are working, and. Uh, we survived the weekend. I had to get into Supply Priest because I had to self I, I had to self isolate over the weekend till the test results came back. So I'm raring to go right now. Now has your bookkeeper recovered yet? She's at home. She's mm-hmm. recovering. She's not had a se- she's not have a severe life threatening case. Okay. She's just has the equivalent of a very bad flu, but it is COVID. Mm-hmm. And evidently, in reading further about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, it will reduce the severity of your infection uh, if it doesn't prevent your getting an infection. Yeah, I think even if you get it, no matter what vaccine you have, it reduces your hospitalization uh, rate. And Mm -hmm. we see that in the stats. Um, You can argue about the vaccine, good or bad, but the stats show that uh, the vaccine is keeping people out of the hospital and keeping people out of the ICU and keeping people out of the cemetery. So there's that. It, it, it's funny. Uh, I read an article. I haven't shared this with you, Kevin. I just saw it before the show that uh, Metropolitan Hilarion, our favorite Russian Orthodox sure. leader, has said it is a sin not to get the COVID vaccine. Whoa, that's that's pretty high up in the Orthodox chain there, George. Yes. I mean, he doesn't say anything that the boss doesn't say is so. Now, in the Orthodox world, the boss is not Jesus Christ. It's it's uh, <laughs> Kirill, the uh, patriarch in Moscow. <laughs> Goodness. All right, let's move on to some uh, news. It's, it's, I'm going to tell you up front, this is a bad news week for the Church of England, which most weeks are recently, and a bad news week for the ACNA, and a bad news week for communism. You know, we're going to cover everything we can here. Um 
you, you basically you're going to be watching the first show just we're a little bit more into the day church of england is the first story um we've talked before uh about the church of england discussing anti-semitism uh, recently, uh, Archbishop Justin Welby has talked about it in regards to what he's seen on the streets of uh, London and around England uh, in regards to what's been going on with the uh, riots and BLM and everything else in the last uh, few months. He, he tweeted and said, anti-Semitism is you know horrible and stop doing it. I, I'm disappointed in the English who are committing anti-Semitism. Very good. That, absolutely. We learned today, and I saw the video, I sent it to George, that the Church of England is now asking forgiveness for something they did hundreds of years ago, almost 500 years ago, not quite. 800 years ago. Yeah, 800 years ago. And I thought, it's interesting to talk about because uh, what do I have to, as an individual Christian, uh, ask forgiveness for? Certainly my sins, known and unknown, but do I have to ask forgiveness for sins committed by Uncle Bruce? Oh boy, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> uh, my my great great grandpa, uh, the guys who came over from Norway two hundred years ago. I mean, w w <laughs> we need to discuss exactly where I need to ask forgiveness because if the church is asking forgiveness, not the church, yeah, the Church of England is asking forgiveness for something that far apart, I need to look at my piece and cues too, George. This is a, use a slightly uh, slightly changed analogy. This is a glass three quarters empty, uh, maybe a drop full. Yes, denouncing anti-Semitism is a very important work of the church. We mm -hmm. commend the, Epis the Church of England for doing so. However, apologizing not for the current manifestations of anti-Semitism, which we see repeatedly in the hierarchy of the uh, Church of England, mm -hmm. uh, especially around the state of Israel and uh, the, the Jewish people in England. Whenever the Church of England feels badly and knows it's put its foot out, put, put a foot wrong, it will apologize, but not for the thing that it's done wrong. Here it's apologizing for the policy, I don't know which king it was, that in the 13th century expelled the Jews from England, well, you can which read, was, read which, the novels of Sir Walter Scott. Sure, and, uh, this but, is you know. Hear what we're saying. That was bad, horrible, atrocious. Was it? Yes, your sin. And apologizing for other people's sins committed eight hundred years ago, mm -hmm. and then patting yourself on the back that you're fighting anti-Semitism is ludicrous. Yes, it's really ludicrous. Um, Kevin, are you going to apologize for the depredations caused by the Vikings 800 years ago? Oh, we hit Ireland. We hit all of Britain, England, Scotland. Yeah, no. Oh, I, would be, I would be spending all day asking forgiveness for my ancestry, uh, which includes the hostile part of Norway and Prussia and Germany. Oh, George, <laughs> my ancestors were really, really bad. It, this is not a Christian worldview, no. apologizing for other people's sins and for the sins of your ancestors. Of course, we have Christ being asked, why, is this, why was this man born blind? What did he do? What did his parents do? Is the par are the sins of the parents being revisited upon the, on the child? And Jesus says, no, it's mm -hmm. not. In Christ, we're in God, the, before God the Father, we're all individuals. We're not a member of a tribe. We're not a member of a family. Uh, you're a Jew or a Gentile but you're not saved because your mother is so-and-so or your great-grandfather was such-and-such. Such. It is who you are, what you believe, what faith is in your heart. And the Church of England, whether it's apologizing for slavery 300 years ago, apologizing for the Amritsar massacre 100 years ago during the, colonial, during the British Raj in India, it's, it always comes across as ludicrous because it doesn't improve relate. This will do nothing to improve the damaged relations with Jews in England. Um, the Church of England was silent when the Labour Party was going out totally wacko on anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. totally, totally, you know, not so. And where was the Church of England? It was nowhere. 
crickets, maybe yeah. individual members, but was mm -hmm. the Church of England there? No. Um, I, I'm sorry, Kevin. I just am so utterly unimpressed and rather cynical well, because I, I, I honestly believe that this is cover for, for another statement denouncing Israel uh, on Gaza or something like that. The church is supposed to lead today, now, not lead yesteryear. You know, we're looking for your leadership right now on the topics of the day, not for what happened 600, 700, 800 years ago. Um, you, you're, you're, you're doing it wrong again. And so that's the story from Church of England. No, there's more. There's more. I uh, posted on Anglican Inc. thanks to... Uh, uh, George Conger, and we just posted another one up here by Lee. Lee uh, Proudlove. Proudlove. Let me pull that up real quick so the audience can see what we're talking about. Of course, it's not right handily available. So go to Anglican.inc and you can look up for yourself. Uh, the Church of England wants to start planting churches or planting uh, ecclesial bodies or planting small groups, if you want to call it. And they're looking at numbers of 10,000 to 20,000, maybe 30,000 to restart the church. And as George and I kind of talked about uh, off screen here, one of the problems they have is they don't have the seed in which to plant. You know, we know they have hard ground. <laughs> Ask the ACNA and GAFCON who are trying to go in there and, and reclaim the Church of England for Christ. The, the ground is hard, but the seed is dead. And so I kind of want to talk to you about what they want to do and how should they do it, George? For friends who are of Kevin's and my generation, you may remember a, a recurring skit on Saturday Night Live when it was good. Gilda Radner would come on to the weekend update and she would give an opinion piece. And one of the ones I remember the best uh, was, what's all this talk I hear about endangered feces? They're everywhere. It's disgusting. Why do we need to worry about that? I thought it'd be a good thing. And Jane Curtin would sort of look at her sidelong and say, uh, it's endangered species. Oh, well, never mind. No, in other words, the, the recurring, uh, the recurring uh, joke was that M Emily Latella would misunderstand either deliberately or just be so daft that she couldn't quite get her ideas around something. The Church of England uh, has an Emily Latella problem. Its clergy, its leaders, combine the... Uh, uh, oh, Kevin, I don't know what to say not to be mean, but <laughs> let me just lay out the facts. Lay, lay, just lay it out. Okay. Yeah, this is afternoon, Kevin, starting about and afternoon, two and George, and we're going to say things a little more frank. Yeah. Starting about two and a half, three years ago, the Church of England, working with the Gregory Center for Church Renewal and Reform, led by a man named John McGinley, Canon John McGinley, I was rector of one of the most successful evangelical parishes in the Church of England in Leicester. And he's been tasked with uh, setting out the Myriad program, building 10,000 worshiping communities in, by, in the next 10 years or so. And this had a series of conferences and papers, and it had the commendation of the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, uh, the Bishop at Lambeth, uh, was co-led a, a symposium that uh, John McGinley gave on this. This is totally coming out of the institution of the Church of England. Now, what are they, and what, and what is the 10,000 uh, uh, church thing? Well, it's sort of like George Bush, the old George Bush's thousand points of light. When two or three are gathered together, Christ is present if they're in prayer. And what we're going to do is we're going to rebuild the Church of England from the ground up, not from the top down. We're going to have communities form of people, maybe meeting in homes and pubs and social centers that can be used to re-evangelize the people at the base level, led by lay people, for lay people, and that can sort of feed into the existing parish system. And then people will sort of be educated into the sacraments, into the life of the church starting with the Bible and seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 
It says a strategy that works very well for the Mormons. It works very well for the Southern Baptists mm -hmm. of uh, sending out lay missionaries. It works very well in parts of Africa where they send out lay Anglican catechists to sort of teach the faith to people. And when it's strong enough, they'll find the money to send a priest. And this was the proposal. Well, when it was talked about prior to the meeting of General Synod, which is meeting at this time, it caused all sorts of outrage. The Anglo-Catholics said, you know, no bishop, no priest, no church. You know, if their sacraments are not front and center in everything, then it can't possibly be called Christian. The sort of pragmatist saying, well, who's going to pay for it? How are we going to have insurance liability coverage? Because we may get some kooks leading things and you'll get a... Uh, cults springing up and how are we going to work this into the Paris system um, and then you had the uh, liberals Martin Percy Giles Frazier saying oh this is the worst thing ever and it's rather funny really that Martin Percy who led the uh, Mau Mau uh, Mau Mauing uh, as uh, to use Tom Wolfe's phrase yes. of, uh, of uh, Philip North to be Bishop of Sheffield Mm -hmm. sort of by having a mob uh, accost him and destroy his reputation, is saying, oh, this is, the Church of England has adopted a Maoist way of thinking, a great leap forward. Uh, and, I, and he condemned that way of thinking. And it is sort of funny because he's one of the great practitioner, practitioners of Maoism and uh, re-education in the Church of England. Maybe it comes naturally to him. So, okay, lots of criticism. But this had the backing of the both archbishops, and it had a week before this, even a week before it was released, we have Stephen Cottrell, Cottrell, Archbishop of York, saying wonderful things about it. Then it, then the uh, firestorm breaks, run and away, the manly, run away, run away. brave Sir Robin from <laughs> uh, Monty Python on the yes. Holy Grail, <laughs> run away, run away, leaving John McGinley to carry the water all by himself, that the people who had worked with him on this program, that had endorsed this program, once it encountered any sort of opposition from the entrenched special interests in the Church of England, they just ran away. That martial spirit that uh, Henry V called out at uh, Agincourt, or the Dunkirk spirit from and Winston Churchill, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the lanes, is not really represented by the Church of England uh, well, at this time. Here in America, the ACNA has had a lot of success with church planting. And I remember talking with Alan Hawking and many other church planters, and they will tell you the model of build it and they will come does not exist in church planting. Maybe 50 years ago or 100 years ago when uh, new churches were arriving in small towns that were starting to build and become influential, that doesn't exist today. In fact, you need lots of tools, lots of people, lots of money, lots of time, and pretty much the leading of the Holy Spirit is where you start. And without those essential things, you're not going to get anywhere, go anywhere, or have a planted church. You're going to have a disaster. Now, even in the best of the you know cases here, only 50 40 50 percent of churches that are planted are there five years or ten years there's a high turnover rate um so you, you really have to ask yourself if nobody's in it except for one or two people in the church of england how is this even gonna get get off the ground george i don't know uh this is part of the pragmatist argument against it Mm -hmm. But I really am impressed by the work that John McGinley and his friends have Absolutely. put into sure. this because yeah. what they're saying is that we're seeking to elevate the involvement of the lay people, which does not mean subtract the leadership or presence of the clergy. Uh, there are some people the, the majority in the Church of England seem to believe this is a zero sum game, that a zero sum game that if you uh, increase the power and presence and responsibilities of the lay people, that means taking it away from the clergy. That's not necessarily so. Um, the, the hope is that this will catch fire and spread because what the Church of England has been doing for evangelism 
over the past few years, with just a few exceptions, has not been very successful. Yeah, that's true. If you look back at church history, uh, you never see a clergy-led movement just take over the world or a, a lay movement just take over the world. But when in, there's an, a partnership between the two, you see a real lasting change within the church. Kevin, so. you're absolutely right. You said the key word, a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, my parish would be considered successful. It's one of the top 25 Episcopal churches in the United States in terms of growth over the past 10 years. Um, why? Is it because I'm a little Billy Graham? No, it's not. I work very hard and I'm good at what I do. But I have had and been blessed by having committed, dedicated, powerful, spiritual lay leaders working together uh, has made all, it makes it work. Mm -hmm. And we're under the guidance and discipline of the Holy Spirit. So when you've got good clergy and you've got committed lay people and they seek the will of Christ, not empire building or trying to, uh, you know, make the church that a little plaything, Little fiefdoms, little kingdoms. Yeah. yeah. Remarkable things can happen. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it myself. Uh, that's been my experience. Um, when you put good people together and allow God to lead, who knows where it'll go? I mean, I've started, I've tried a lots of different initiatives in my time as a priest, and I've probably junked eight out of 10 of them. But that 20% has really allowed things to take off. And what's interesting about that 20%, that 20% only may work where you are, where another 10% of the 80 works somewhere else or five percent mm -hmm. of the 80 works somewhere else you know it, it is amazing how the holy spirit really grasps hold of individuals lay and clergy who are obedient who are seeking the righteousness and who are seeking to share that with other people mm -hmm. when you don't have that desire when you're not trying to share the seed the good news things kind of get real political and fall apart quick it, it, look at reading social media and the Episcopal Church commentators, the church go growth gurus, they're all uniformly negative, mm -hmm. uh, saying within 10 years, a third of the population of the Episcopal Church will be dead, according to the actuarial tables from insurance companies. I mean, because a third are over 80 or over 75. Or over something. 75, that very yeah. well, it may well be true. Yeah. Um, but I'm still optimistic because the power of the Spirit can just chain things, change and motivate and bring people into the life of the church that you just can't possibly imagine will be interested at all. Um, I'm optimistic about the Episcopal Church. I'm optimistic about the ACNA. Now, I'm not optimistic about some other parts of the Episcopal <laughs> Church. Uh, I think they're doubling down on bad bets and uh, like a gambler at a casino at 5 a.m., they've got their last few chips, and only if they get 21 on the roulette, on the wheel, it'll all, they'll make their fortune back. Well, I don't the, think that's going to happen. Let, let's we have at the bottom of the list the Michael Curry story. Let's move him up a couple. So okay. Michael Curry made a statement in regards to the indigenous uh, child bodies that were found in graves. He said mass graves in Canada. Uh, it's a long and complicated story, but he's using misinformation to really lean the story to his side, which is dishonest and dishonorable to uh, the people he's trying to communicate to. And I thought we could clear that up, George. Yeah, Michael Curry has a remarkable ability to miss the point and to misconstrue news stories. He was one of the loudest voices saying that the January 6th riots at the Capitol and in Washington were an armed uprising, a civil insurrection that was worse than 9-11 and the most dangerous threat to our nation since the Civil War. They were armed with iPhones, George. Don't go teasing that. <laughs> and here's a funny thing. Nobody was arrested. No, of None of the people arrested had weapons. The only people who had weapons were the Capitol Police. I am a gun owner, and I would never take a gun to downtown Washington, D.C. Never. Okay, well, yesterday, Monday, uh, Michael Curry released a statement on the Canadian residential school issue, which is a little bold of him. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Canada has a problem in that the Canadian government policy was to educate Native children at boarding schools uh, run by the government and administered by various churches or by government bodies. Uh, the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, the Presbyterians all had their own residential schools. These schools sought to basically make little white men, little mm -hmm. Canadians, out of these children. A little uh, Western to drive capitalist. A, to drive away their native languages and cultures in place of uh, Western European, English, or French mm -hmm. culture, whatever it may be. This school system was around for about 100 years. And it ended in, I think, in the 60s and 70s. There are some still residential schools for children who live in the middle of nowhere and their parents want them to have decent education. There are Indian boarding schools still. America, we call them Indians. In Canada, they call them First Nation people, mm -hmm. where they use the name of the tribe. Well, there have been some horrible stories about unmarked graves with several hundred unmarked graves, probably over a thousand now, discovered at these long closed residential schools. And this has caused some uh, nasty elements to go on to the Indian lands and burn down churches as a protest against the Christian churches for what they are alleged to have done. Okay. And the left... And what are they alleged to have done before... Mistreated into... Indian children. Yeah. And the story... The, what is the, the trigger? Finding unmarked single graves of children who died 100 years ago, 50 years ago, in abandoned cemeteries. Now, Michael Curry says that the mass graves of Indian children who were caught in the cultural genocide, I think it's offensive to use the word genocide or in this graves. context. Or and mass, mass graves. Um, yeah, absolutely. That was wrong. Now, when you think when a mass grave and a genocide is what happened in Poland, when the Einsatz group and came into a village, rounded up all the Jews, shot them all in, you know, lined them up in the edge of a pit, shot them, and buried the bodies and moved on. That's a mass grave. That's a genocide. Mm -hmm. Here we have a misguided school, school policy with occasional, with lethargy, inaction, and a few perverts thrown in to make it totally miserable for the survivors. Mm -hmm. Sure. But we don't have a campaign to deliberately exterminate Indian children. And Michael Curry is using the language that we would describe what happened in Poland under the Nazis or in Rwanda or in Cambodia and equating that to the residential school problem. So when you do that, you cheapen what happens in those places where real genocide took place. And then you also, uh, by using hyperbole and exaggeration, you make people think, well, really, you know, of course they, the, the Mounties didn't line up Canadian Indian children and on the edge of a pit shoot them and bury them in a mass grave. Then you disbelieve the whole thing. Yeah. It's, it's, this exaggeration is just so foolish and unhelpful. What Kevin and George are not saying is, we're not saying this is a good situation. This was a bad school situation. There are mm -hmm. victims here. What we are saying is there's no mass graves. Okay. There are unmarked graves, individual unmarked graves, because what happens to wood crosses, George? Wood crosses in abandoned cemeteries that uh, deteriorate mm -hmm. and disappear the elements. Several of these Indian schools had crosses and markers made of wood that over the course of decades have, have gone. Other had unmarked graves the way we have in Florida if you die and your family don't, Florida prisons if you die and your family doesn't take your remains, you're bar, buried in a potter's field, an unmarked grave outside the prison walls. Um, that's just how things are done. And also, people sort of have a modern-day worldview that children don't die. But a hundred years ago, children died of diphtheria. Of, they died of measles. They didn't, they didn't have to be executed, which is what genocide implies. If you get a chance, go visit the local city cemetery and look 
at uh, children who died in the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the 30s, and all before that, tuberculosis, measles, mumps, anything could uh, raise the fever, cause the infection, and boom, that's it. Uh, my uh, dad's sister died because she was going to get her tassels out, and she had some anesthesia that just was not well developed back in the, the late 40s. And she succumbed to the effects of anesthesia. You know, it, it, there was, it was not uncommon for your neighbors or your family of five or ten or seven siblings to have lost one, two, or three. Mm-hmm. And um, I, when I visit cemeteries and I see these, you know, twins next to each other buried of different ages and stuff like that, it's just like, you know, you lost them be- five years apart. That's hard. That's and and this also, as Kevin says, this sort of ties into what we're saying about the Church of England of the deliberate misunderstanding. Yeah. That sort of you go on and on and on about something that didn't happen and use up all your energy and enthusiasm. And like, what was? Oh well, never mind. Um, well, I've set the stage for our next story, um, which is cool, because right now I have the AC off and it's hot in here. You know how hot it is? It's Cuba hot. Uh, this is Havana hot. It's humid. I got you know droplets forming on the face. And our next story is about what we're seeing in Cuba. Now, contextually, this is perfect for people of our age, George and I. We grew up in the 80s when we saw uh, almost monthly the the Cold War going on and the the Berlin Wall. And every once in a while, hearing about people getting shot trying to escape East Germany. And you have Walter Cronkite on the evening news and other news today. So and so tried to escape some gate or climb over. If I may give Alexandria yeah. Ocasio Cortez uh, a little historical lesson. Oh, please. The wall in East Berlin was designed to keep people in. Not the out. wall along the American border with Mexico is designed to keep people out. Difference. Differences in the use big, of the wall. Big difference. And so we have this con- this understanding of communism and democratic socialism and uh, capitalism and colonialism that the younger generation just doesn't understand, George. When my kids hear about what's happening in Cuba, they're thinking, oh, they must not be, they're not getting their COVID shots. That's why they're marching through the streets. At least that's what the uh, uh, press sec- secretary of the United States tells us. This isn't about freedom. They have all the freedom they want. They live on an island, George. And so we have this cultural misunderstanding about what's happening. In fact, I'm going to turn the AC on this hot. hot. Keep, keep talking. Get, get them the update, George. Okay. On, on, on Sunday, some protests began on the western side of the island of Cuba. And during Sunday morning, these protests spread eastward towards Havana, or winding up in Santiago de Cuba on the eastern coast of Cuba. The result being, in the, by the afternoon, hundreds of thousands of people had taken to the streets, demanding an end to the communist regime of President uh, Diaz, uh, I forget it's the second. Miguel Diaz-Canal. Diaz-Canal. Yeah. Uh, President Diaz Canal. The Castro brothers, uh, Fidel and Raul, are gone. They're off the scene, but their their regime is still in place. Mm-hmm. And there's some extraordinary videos taken by people with their iPhones, their cell phones in Cuba that made it onto social media on Sunday afternoon. There are images of the Cuban parliament in Havana surrounded by thousands of people shouting in unison, Libertad, Libertad, Liberty, Liberty. There are images of a crowd marching towards Communist Party headquarters, bearing aloft Cuban and American flags, shouting uh, freedom, liberty. Uh, I, I must say, I am surprised by the amount of American flags you can find in Cuba. Well, <laughs> I don't think you'll see these reports in the New York Times because no. the New York Times tells us their reporters are triggered by the sight of American flags, uh, which they view as inherently racist and white supremacist. So I guess it's white supremacists have risen against the communist regime. Now, where is this coming from? Well, many of the leaders 
are from the Christian churches in Cuba. Rank and file pastors and priests, um, Catholic Church is the largest church, but there's a strong Protestant element in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Episcopal. And they're Episcopal, and uh, there's even an ACNA presence through the Reformed Episcopal Church in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And these people uh, are, have been leading the fight. Now, on Sunday afternoon, the Cuban government swooped down on church leaders who they suspected of disloyalty and placed them under house arrest or hauled them off to prison. And Sunday night, the Cuban government shut off social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, other things. They left Twitter on, oddly enough. Maybe they think that Twitter will censor the <laughs> They will them. censor, yes. <laughs> Fact check. Cuba's just an island. <laughs> so we're at living in momentous days. President... Uh, President Diaz went on to the TV on Sunday night. And you can see Cuban TV in Miami just with your radar, your antenna. So this was quickly, as soon as it was on, it was rebroadcast in the United States, saying, calling on Communist Party members to take to the streets to fight the protesters. So it's going to get bloody if it hasn't already. And now there's been sort of a, a blackout. We don't really know what's happening now. The U.S. government's first response was Assistant Secretary for Western Hemispheric Affairs, uh, Julia Chung or Chong or Chang. I want to say Connie Chung, but it wasn't Connie Chung. No, it wasn't. Uh, Julia <laughs> Same Chung. spelling, yes. Julia Chung uh, said, you know, oh, these poor people are protesting because of COVID. And isn't that sad? And we wish everybody peace. And Marco Rubio uh, responded, who's a Republican senator from Miami, uh, from Florida, but he's from Miami, <laughs> yes. and of Cuban and of Cuban descent. His parents were refugees. Uh -huh. Said they're not complaining about COVID. They want liberty, libertad. If you look at the videos, which you can see on the social media on, um, and various pages, it looks like scenes from The Godfather Part Two, except they're more extras uh, in the in real life. It's a real revolution is forming. Now, we don't know if it's being squashed by the army and the paramilitaries, uh, but the Christian leaders are at the forefront calling for democracy, citing the United States as its model. President Trump on Sunday gave his full backing and support to the protesters. Uh, and then Jen Psaki, the, Psaki, the uh, White House Pests officer on Monday morning was asked, you know, what does it say that the Cuban protesters are waving Cuban and American flags? America is a source of hope for them. And she sort of gave a waffle answer saying, well, we don't want anybody to be hurt or upset. And of course, Peace. this is about COVID. Yeah. She, and it finally took uh, to, I've seen the new statement put out by the White House after this hysterics about how clueless could they be where Joe Biden is saying he supports the Democratic protests in Havana. So the White House is now on board, but they just got clobbered in terms of timing and their initial inclinations of what to say by the Republicans and President Trump, former President Trump. Um, well, they got hammered because of that perspective I talked about before. There's the people born before the Berlin Wall fall, fell and the people born after it. And Jen Kasaki there was born after it, clearly. Because she is like, well, I don't know why they're, they're marching. That's kind of weird. It must be because the hospitals are full and they're, they're just overwhelmed because of COVID. It can't be because they want anything else. Obama went down there a couple of times. It's a really a nice island, guys, where they don't, they've lost that clueness this 60 years since the revolution. Eduardo, that place has been occupied. Eduardo, uh, I think it's Eduardo Canal the leader of the MCL, Movimiento Cristiano Liber Liberación, the Christian Liberation Movement, which is sort of the umbrella group for Christian uh, Christians involved in politics in Cuba, posted a statement, why is this happening? He wrote an article. Uh, it's been archived elsewhere because the Cuban-based website has been taken down. Uh, he, he said that, you know, we have total economic collapse. We've had that for 60 plus years. People food is in very short supply. We live hand to mouth. And for years we've been told, well, you don't, it's, that may be true, but everybody can read and write and we have the best medical system in the world. Well, the Cuban medical system has collapsed in the sense that 
the hospitals are so heavily overwhelmed by COVID patients. Cuba is has developed its own COVID drug, but people refuse to take it because there's, uh, they don't trust the government and the infrastructure to distribute it has broken down. And the lies that people have told over the years about Cuba's model of medical uh, science. Pe this is, was Bernie Sanders' uh, point that, you know, you can't say that everything was bad about Cuba. Look at their medical system. The, that's untrue, what Bernie was saying. Very untrue. It's, everything has now fallen apart, where there's 6,000, the government admits there's 6,000 new COVID cases each day this month. Um, for an island of only 3 million people, that's pretty darn bad. Um, yeah. It's interesting, from my perspective, to watch the younger generation try and figure out what's going on here. You know, you and I have known uh, and growing up knowing that the Soviet Union, communism, the Iron Curtain, bad. Cuba, the missile crisis. Nobody, uh, there's nobody in the White House except maybe Joe Biden who remembers the missile crisis. You know, it's it's just. I mean, and. One of the little fashion icons of left of the left are wearing these Che Guevara T-shirts, uh, and if people really knew about Che Guevara, it's akin to wearing a Heinrich Himmler T-shirt. Che Guevara uh, led the persecution of homosexuals under in in uh, Cuba. It was illegal, uh, well, punishable by imprisonment in Cuba to be gay up until recently. Uh, the Castro brothers had to die, had to leave the scene before you could be illegally out homosexual in Cuba. Uh, Guevara uh, was a mass murderer who despised blacks and he despised Indians. He was of European descent. He was as racist as David Duke. And you see these clueless teenagers walking around with Che Guevara t-shirts and you know, trying to emulate him with the little goatee beards because they can't grow a real beard like Kevin and a beret. My God, you know, there's such ignorance of history here. All right, so let's move on to our last story and then a cliffhanger. Um, we've reported now for three weeks in a row about the Diocese of the Upper Midwest uh, and what's been happening. The most recent news, obviously, is uh, Bishop uh, Stuart Ruck had to step down. He asked uh, Archbishop Foley if that was step okay. Step aside. Step aside. Yeah, did I say step, step. aside? Step aside. Temporarily step aside and let a third party investigate this and let's get this worked out. You know, let's let's make this right. It was good for him to do so, but now there's kind of a vacuum. And in this vacuum, people of a lesser collar, <laughs> what do you want to call, people not wearing purple, are making trouble. And I'm speaking specifically of uh, some people in uh, Christ for the Sake of Others are making trouble with the Diocese of the Upper Midwest on social media. And the accusations are going beyond what I would think a Christian community trying to help people recover would want to be saying, George. Okay, let's give a little background because people might be going, what are you talking about? <laughs> After I say something, they always say Christ that. Our Light Anglican Church in Illinois was a spinoff of Church of the Resurrection of Wheaton, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a lay Eucharist, a lay leader who was involved in ministry. Mm -hmm. Lay catechist. Who, lay catechist, and he is accused of rape. Allegedly. raping women, yeah. uh, abusing children, molesting mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the people at this mission did not take the victim seriously. And from, from what we can read. From, from what we can read so far, we don't know the full facts. We, George and I know one and a half percent of what we should know here. Because it, this is there are victims here that we don't need to know their names, ages, and stuff like that. They're young people. We don't. We don't, we don't need to know. But we do need to take this seriously and be honest about it, admit where, we, where the church is screwed up, and find a path forward and lay out steps so this never happens again. It looks like the, the parish followed the old system of we can, let's not air our dirty laundry, we can solve this internally. Mm -hmm. And basically didn't believe the victims. And 
instead of kicking it to an independent tribunal or investigatory body, it was all kept in-house. And then when it did make its way up the chain, so to speak, the guy's since been arrested and has been was recently released on bail on rape charges, the, the lay catechist. So we're talking serious stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the diocesan administrators appear to have dropped the ball and basically try to be pastoral rather than juridical when it was their responsibility to lead juridical and then be pastoral. And the bishop is stepping aside because these are his guys. And it's the, the uh, nobody I'm aware of is accusing Bishop Rock of malfeasance. They're accusing him of basically not supervising his staff. And so he's been dropped into this. Okay, so that's the situation. It's all alleged. Bishop Rock stepped to aside. And the problem is he sort of stepped aside too far because he wanted to step aside to allow an independent investigation called by the Standing Committee into this whole process to see what the problem is. Meanwhile, there have been some clergy from outside the diocese in the ACNA starting to throw stones. And they're pretty big stones. Um, and this has caused members of the diocese of the upper midwest to r push back against these clergy and now if you look on social media you're seeing sort of the d level of comp of argument well you would say that wouldn't you or you're a woman priest therefore you're a heretic i don't need to listen to you um un totally unnecessary stuff the, the point being some people need to know when to shut up and they need to have some bishops who say, keep your mouth shut till it's all done. You think that you, you think that you're clear, pure as, pure as the driven snow, that everybody wants to know your opinion. Frankly, they don't. And if you put your oar into this, you're going to start bringing partisan ACNA rivalries between the Seeker Church branch of ACNA and the charismatic touchy-feely branch of the ACNA and so now what we've got is we've got a war that's supposedly about failure to follow the canons on abuse that's developing into a personality conflict between two different strands of the ACNA's DNA. Mm -hmm. And Bishop Ruck should have basically said to his mean people on social media, shut up, don't say anything, it's under advisement, it's under investigation. And the other side should have told its people, don't issue manifestos, don't issue statements, don't get on your high horse just because you're a canon theologian. Nobody wants to know what you're thinking until the facts are all out. No, we're now in recovery is mode. This is yeah. the, we, we have hit a place where we have to recover. We have to help the people who are victims. We have to help restore the church. We have to make sure steps are followed that this does not happen again and that we have a, you know, a, a system in place so that there won't be the little banter that goes on because somebody made a mistake. This is a time that these clergy people and lay people of influence need to gag themselves. Stop. It, you're bringing down the church. We're here to glorify Christ. And hopefully at the end of this process, which is redeemable, watch last, week, last week's episode, um, Christ can be glorified in this. And I fully expect that. As a member of an ethnic church, I've seen worse, and um, I've seen Christ glorified. So allow the, allow the media to do its job. Allow the different players to do the job. The media, the investigatory bodies, um, the various bureaucracies, mm -hmm. and withhold comment until or unless you can say, "Hey, they have done this completely wrong, and their conclusion is is without merit." You know, there's a right time to raise your critic criticisms and complaints, letters of solidarity, and there's a wrong time. And we're seeing we're seeing the effects of that, of pouring fuel on a, a fire. Indeed. So before you, I'm sure there's a Bible verse about slivers and logs somewhere, but before you do something like that, perhaps it's time to let the church heal, and that will only heal with your silence. Sorry. 
Okay, cliffhanger. Kevin, Kevin, oh, yeah. Kevin oh, we yeah. need to explain for those lacking in cognitive abilities. We're not talking about the silence of the victim. No, no, no. We're not saying we should hush this up. We're not saying any of that. But we're saying allow the system, which people have invested a great deal of time, monergy, money, and energy into perfecting, given all the history we have with the Catholic abuse crisis, with the abuse crises we've had in various other churches and in institutions, the mechanisms the ACNA has on paper are pretty darn good. They just need to be followed. Yeah. Stick to them and keep your mouth shut until the time. I mean, the ACNA was put together with 2,000 years of experience. They have and 2,000 the, lawyers, it seems. <laughs> they have this on paper. Here's what we need to do. It, it's, it's simple steps. When, when A happens, do B. And I, it hurts that we have to be in this situation. As I've said before, well, hold on. As I said before, GAFCON is a mature organization. ACNA is a mature organization. It will survive this. But I'm not so sure it's going to survive the, the, the little clergy people bantering back and forth on social media. That's, that's really, that's despicable. Yeah? It, from an old, wise, bald guy in a trailer just outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, George, let's move on to a little cliffhanger. So... We develop news stories. Sometimes news stories fall in our lap. Sometimes we get uh, a hint of something happening here or there, and we just oh, we need this to, to 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 fester a little more. We need this to formulate more. We we need to wait to get more information before we go forward with this. We have a really hot one on our laps, George. And uh, I don't know if it's going to break before Friday. But I want to be fair to people who are trying to enjoy their summer vacation, like Andrew Gross, who just posted pictures of his Western Rodeo on Facebook. I don't want this to drop with him in the, in the rodeo. So I'm going to try and gather some more stuff and get together. And hopefully by Friday or next Tuesday, we'll have this amazing story put together for you, which uh, it's a bit unbelievable. Uh, and... George knows the story, and what what are your expectations of the story, George? It's going to be a bad month for the ACNA. It's going to be a bad month, or it can be a great month, mm -hmm. depending upon how the leaders handle this. I think it'd be a bad month for GAFCON, a redeemable month for for the ACNA. We'll see. Well, you know, and I'm not just being coy. Remember mm -hmm. the Uganda ad adultery scandal? Mm -hmm. That first week was a bad month. Yeah, but it yeah. ended on the highest of possible high notes yeah. for the Church of Uganda. This is a similar situation, but I can we can tell you it has nothing to do with adultery. No, it doesn't. So I'm sorry. <laughs> You're kind of leading down the wrong trail there, George. But it's a redeemable story. We'll let you have that. I nothing have... to do with people keeping their pants on, which no. I'm sure will disappoint people. I'm sorry. You know, there's been enough of that bad stuff going on in our church. So I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 673 of Anglican Unscripted.